2017, the global chemical industry was estimated to be worth nearly $5.7 trillion, and that figure could double by 2030. It's also one of the biggest contributors to carbon dioxide emissions. So, could green chemistry make a difference? We find out in this episode of Sustainable Energy. Today I'm looking at ways to make the chemical industry greener using nature-based solutions, our theme this year. Later, I'll be speaking with Paul Anastas. He's the director of the Centre for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale University. Paul is regarded as the father of green chemistry after publishing green chemistry theory and practice in 1998. Along with his co-author John Warner, they established the original pillars for sustainable chemistry. We'll also look at how green chemistry has developed globally and what could be lying ahead. Also, coming up on this episode. We show you how the chemical industry is affecting climate and the environment. We ask, how can green chemistry help reduce its impact? Turning grape juice into wine is a well-known chemical reaction. We'd be traveling to the south of France to find out how a greenhouse gas is ensuring bottles are good enough to drink. In these plants, nearly half a billion cork closures are manufactured and sold worldwide. Then we head to New Zealand to meet a man who has a tiny solution for the big problem of electronic waste. A lot of the value is contained within those chips, so we really need to make sure it's exposed. Chemistry impacts our lives in so many ways, through the clothes we wear, the food we eat, and even the medicine we take. And there's growing interest in the subject, because according to the International Energy Agency, the chemical sector is a big polluter and the largest industrial energy consumer. Green chemistry, on the other hand, has one goal, to design chemical products to reduce or eliminate hazardous substances attached to them. But why should we care? As global income rises, our need for modern products relying on chemicals is also growing. Thanks to them, we can heat and power our homes, buy clothing and access telecommunication, media and music. This is good for the global economy, but chemicals may affect human health and the environment if not properly managed. In 2016, the European Environment Agency estimated 62% of chemicals consumed in Europe were hazardous to health. The same year, the World Health Organization claimed certain chemicals could have impacted the health of over 1.6 million people and contributed to many deaths. Chemicals also affect the world around us. Chemical fertilizers are threatening pollinators like bees, phosphorus and nitrogen used in agriculture wash into rivers and oceans. Too many nutrients cause algal blooms which steal the oxygen leading to ocean dead zones. These blooms also affect wildlife including shellfish which when eaten can make us ill. Experts say the question is not whether chemicals are necessary, they are, but rather which chemicals and processes will be needed for a more sustainable future. Green chemistry promotes the use of chemicals from renewable sources like plants and electrochemistry to create gases like hydrogen for use as a fuel. Green chemicals should be designed to be non-toxic and to degrade easily and rapidly. Professor Walter Leitner has some suggestions. Nature is the inspiration here in many ways. In particular, if we think about the uh, raw materials that we can use, CO2 and water and energy from the sun like nature does, but then not try to mimic the very complex mechanism that nature uses in photosynthesis, but come up with really efficient technologies that we can set in an industrial setting. In 2002, world leaders agreed to minimize adverse impacts of chemicals and waste by 2020. But these targets won't be met, so the UN has renewed its call for urgent action against chemical pollution. Increased consumer demand for greener and more sustainable products suggests there's an opportunity for both scientists and entrepreneurs. Professor Paul Anastas, thank you for joining us on Sustainable Energy. Obviously, you are in the US and I'm in France due to COVID travel restrictions, but it's great to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Asha. It's wonderful to be here with you. 
you are a green chemistry pioneer. How did you get involved in green chemistry in the first place? Well, when, when I was a young chemist, I looked around at all of the technological miracles that chemistry produced, really produced modern life. And then I looked at the other side of the equation, all of the unintended consequences of pollution and its effect on the environment and on human health. So green chemistry is really a way of keeping all of those technological miracles, those innovations, without all of those unintended consequences. In your book, you laid out the 12 principles of green chemistry. Why is preventing waste at the top of that list? Waste, we need to recognize, is a man-made concept. In nature, there is no waste. Every time a waste is generated, an organism evolves to use that waste as a feedstock. And so we think about how to do the same thing in industry, how you either prevent or avoid waste or utilize whatever waste in a valuable way. How are companies putting that into application and how are they getting on with it? So many companies are using green chemistry as, as part of their business model, as part of their strategic planning. I simply cannot name an industry sector that isn't using green chemistry. Everything from pharmaceuticals to plastics, everything from, oh, cosmetics to the way that we generate, store, and transport our energy. Now, I'm not going to say that companies are doing it systematically or in all of their products, but great strides are being made. Chemical solvents are heavily used in industrial chemistry, but manufacturing them uses a lot of energy. How can they be made more sustainable? They're some of our highest volume chemicals and they're also some of the most highly regulated because of their historic hazards to humans and the environment. But yet green chemistry is showing how you can use new solvents. Sometimes they're bio-based solvents. Sometimes you can use water for things that we never thought you could use water for before as a solvent. And what's really interesting, there's even ways of using carbon dioxide and putting it in a liquid form in order to use that as a solvent. So it's non-toxic, it's cheap, and it doesn't have all of the same problems of those traditional chlorinated organic solvents. How easy is it to reduce the use of energy in chemical production by applying the principles of green chemistry? We've forced chemicals to do things they didn't naturally want to do. So we've heated them up, we've put them under pressure, and we've tortured them to, to obey and become the things we want them to become. But it's not just the quantities of energy that's important. It's the character and the nature of energy that we use. It needs to be renewable and non-depleting and non-toxic and not polluting. Thank you, Paul Anastas. Thank you so much. We'll hear more from Paul Anastas later in the show. It's now time for a break. When we return, we head out to the vineyards of southern France to find out how CO2 is being put to good use in wine bottles. We are pressurizing the CO2 in order to have a specific property of the CO2, which is called supercritical.